especially with India and I think Southeast Asia as an economy, there's this a sort of a new confidence, I think, in the last five to seven years where they really want to put themselves out there, put out not just great price, but really good quality, innovative, often even cutting edge product. And I'm speaking not just limited to producers, but I think as an economy and a community on the whole. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. We've seen marketplaces become prime destinations for consumers who want to discover new brands, search a wide variety of products, and get what they need quickly and easily. But what I find most interesting about this evolving marketplace space is what's happening on the B2B side. So how artisans and creators can connect with possible retail sellers and partners through a more seamless and robust digital experience. But what if there was something more intentional and even more values-driven in that experience? That's exactly what Kalara provides. And today, I'm speaking with the founder and CEO, Aditi Pani. And Aditi has a fascinating backstory that brought her to business founder and retailer founder. So I wanted to dig into her inspiration, her background, and how she has used that foundation, those roots, to develop the framework for the Kalara business, because they are growing. It is truly a great story focused on the power of values, of intentional retail, and creating a, not just an experience, a community of brands, artisans, and sellers to really rally around a central vision. Aditi, thanks so much for being on the show. It's great to meet you. Thank you, Alicia, for making me a part of your podcast. Of course, of course. And honestly, the reason why is you have such a fascinating backstory and journey of how you got to where you are today, CEO of Kalara. So can you share a little bit about, I guess, the origin story? We have a lot of founders and entrepreneurs on our show, and I always love to get a feel for how people got to where they are today. So how did you go from an engineer student to a retail exec to a business founder? Like, what was that progression like? Sure. So I think my journey in some ways does start when I was an engineering student. And I was, in fact, the first woman ever to be elected president of our male majority student community. And I think that experience fueled a certain idealism in me, which led me to work in the social venture sector in my early career. But I soon realized that while amazing work was being done by social entrepreneurs, it almost always remained relatively small in its impact. And at that time, I I longed to learn from large businesses and corporates that had scaled and had national or global reach, uh, which is when I decided to pursue an MBA. I was lucky to be at Stanford University and then uh, went on to work in corporate retail for over a decade. And during that time, I had the opportunity to be really at the helm of a leading fashion e-commerce business, starting as employee one and then going on to be the chief operating officer, which was an incredible experience. But five years in, I think I reached a point where I felt that I had amassed enough experience that gave me the confidence to marry both the desire to make social impact as well as the capability or confidence to build a large business, which then ultimately led to the creation of Galara. And at Kalara, we are enabling retailers and businesses around the world in over 50 countries to source responsibly and conveniently, while also helping producers, especially of eco-friendly and artisanal products from India and Southeast Asia, access global markets efficiently. So in a nutshell, that's been my journey. Yeah, it's amazing. And our e-commerce editor, Nicole Silverstein, actually covered your story, which is what inspired me to have you on the show. And what really resonated with me as I was prepping for this conversation is that your founding of 
the business was in a way almost like a full circle moment. Like your parents were very entrepreneurial and and artistic. So I would love to learn more about how you kind of tapped into those roots or turned that into an opportunity. Because I think that intersection of intentional commerce or purpose-driven commerce with supporting local artisans and businesses, like it's, it's really powerful. So how did that background, that experience with your family kind of fuel or inspire you, if at all? Absolutely, it did. I think I'm so fortunate and grateful to my entire family. My dad, my mom, and even my grandmom, who I lived with for a very long time. I think each of them shaped me into who I am today. My dad is a first-generation technology entrepreneur to date. My mom is an interior designer and an avid art enthusiast. And my grandmom was a very active social worker right up until she passed away earlier this year at the age of 91. And I think this was this combination of tech entrepreneurship at a time that it didn't really exist, art and design for my mom and social impact for my grandmom. Really, it's sort of subconsciously been a part of me growing up. It's what I observed. It's what I learned. It's what I saw at fairly close quarters. And I think that anchored my passion and my motivation and also my research, you know, when I reached that point that, hey, I want to do something more meaningful with the rest of my life. And I found that opportunity in in what we're trying to do in Kalara today. So Yeah, I think it's just been an integral part of my growing up. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's interesting that your upbringing, your different members of your family kind of brought different skill sets, both hard skills as well as soft skills. And I feel like founding stories, there's typically a narrative of like, oh, I identified a need because I was in the industry or I knew people in a specific industry. And that's what they kind of tap into, which I think is important. But I think the fact that you had that intimate connection with social impact, with artistry, with technology, it it was kind of like this perfect combination of components that helps you start the business, which is fascinating. Right. And that's why I think I'm so fortunate and so grateful to my family. Yeah. No, it's amazing. So at the same time, so when you started your retail journey, it was kind of in the midst of the surge of e-commerce in India, right? So I'm wondering how that played a role or helped supported your transition from working for a brand to founding a retail-centric business. Like, can you share a little bit about like the evolution or, or the growth that was happening in the market and how maybe that played a role or supported your vision for starting and growing Kalara? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Alicia. My journey definitely coincided with the rise of e-commerce in India. Over this decade, I think we saw very distinct stages. In the first phase, we saw major global players like Amazon, Uber, and others enter India alongside the emergence and then subsequently the absolute mushrooming of Indian e-commerce startups that were also supported by marquee global VCs like Lightspeed and Sequoia and others looking to replicate the success that they had seen in the West in emerging markets like India. And I think very quickly that phase was then followed by, you know, advancements in the entire ecosystem. So we saw paradigm shift in payments, a complete shift from cash to digital payments. And I think India is perhaps today one of the most advanced economies when it comes to digital payments. We saw massive developments in warehousing and last mile as a service, and therefore the infrastructure that came with it uh, across country. And of course, a lot of advancement in technology as well across the entire e-commerce stack. And I think by this time, there was a definite dominance of also Indian homegrown players in the market with very market-specific innovation coming in. And I think by this time, we actually reached hit COVID. And interestingly, what happened during COVID was that while e-commerce prior to COVID was primarily focused in the lifestyle sector, uh, during COVID, it actually expanded into more essential categories like groceries, which led to the growth of hyper-local and then omni-channel commerce. And I think at that same time, you know, it also forced digital engagement in the B2B part I mean, in the B2B industry in general, broadly across, because we couldn't travel, trade fairs had to be cancelled, people couldn't cross borders, most certainly. 
And I think that was a very natural and also in some ways accelerated evolution into what I think is going to play out in the next 10 years in B2B commerce and especially cross-border B2B commerce. I do believe that we will see very similar evolution in the ecosystem definitely see a lot more players coming into the place. You know, there's already a broad playbook. It just needs to be adapted to a different context now. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like that B2B context, like there are some universal trends and and expectations, I think, especially as we go through the online customer experience or the marketplace experience. But there are some nuances, right? Like you're maybe buying through a committee format, like there are several players that maybe have to make decisions or there are specific needs for businesses. But I want to kind of peel back the onion, so to speak, on the business model, because I'm glad you kind of brought up the B2B opportunity and the growth that's happening there. I want to start with, you know, how you kind of built this model to serve the artisans and those creators. So were there any specific challenges that you were trying to address or solve for, especially as you thought through the value of the platform for them, like making sure that it was appealing or even trustworthy, right? We're hearing more about like trustworthy partnerships in retail and and the impacts there. So how did you kind of parse out what you wanted to provide to the artisans and to the brands specifically? And then we'll kind of get into the business side. Sure. So in terms of challenges, when we started looking at it, Alicia, there were tons. Avenues for artisanal products and brands to be discovered, and especially globally, is very limited. Global payments are complex and not digital friendly. Compliance requirements are often ambiguous. The global supply chain is is complex and cumbersome and, of course, was completely thrown away during the pandemic. And on top of all of that, there's language barriers, there's, you know, various other challenges that come with it. And when we looked at just all of the various issues surrounding the space, we decided to build Kalara as a full stack platform, which means that it's not just a marketplace where you have producers, you have buyers, and they're kind of left to themselves. We actually decided that we'll play a heavily involved role in a way that we take care of the global supply chain at both ends. We take care of global payments. We take care of compliance. We take care of communication and all of that in between so that the producer can focus on what they do best, which is make incredible products wherever they make it. It could be in the northeastern part of the country. It could be in the southern coast. Wherever they make it, we just pick it up from them or their workshops or their factories and take care of everything else. So that was our approach. We went head on saying that if you want to truly build a platform that is convenient, that's reliable, that's responsible, and that's digitally enabled, we'll need to be all in. So that's been our approach. Yeah, that's great. I think knowing that these artisans, these creators have an outlet or a resource to kind of help with the tactical behind the curtain stuff, so to speak, is probably reassuring for a lot of folks. Like I know some people that create products as a side hustle or just because they like to do it, but they are struggling trying to keep pace with all of the ins and outs of the technology, right? And like how to build out the infrastructure they need to if they want that business to scale. So knowing that they can kind of offset it or pass it on to someone or something that knows it or, and has the capabilities they need, that that's probably a big, big value driver. But how much, if at all, is the values driven component part of this? Like for the brands, because like I know on the retailer side or the business side that is looking to source these brands, obviously they're looking to identify and partner with local artisans, ethical brands, but like for the brands themselves, like, do you find that there's a connection or a resonance there? Like, as you talk about the backstory of Kalara and why you're doing what you're doing, basically? I do think so. I think the global movement towards sustainable consumption and therefore sustainable production is truly global. It's, it's not, you know, limited to the West. I think it's across the board. 
We're seeing a lot of innovation happen, even on the producer's end. And, you know, we work with small producers, mid-sized producers, and also larger producers. And we see that across that spectrum. And I think, you know, there's also, especially with India, and I think Southeast Asia as an economy, there's, there's a sort of a new confidence, I think, in the last five to seven years where they really want to put themselves out there, put out not just great price, but really good quality, innovative, often even cutting edge product. And I'm speaking not just limited to producers, but I think as an economy and a community on the whole. And I think from that standpoint, there's definitely resonance in what they want to do, how they want to do it and why they're doing you know, what they're doing. So I do think it's a very, very interesting time today for this part of the world and that sort of getting married with this whole movement towards sustainability. Great. So looking at the other side of the business, the retailers and businesses that want to source these brands, what can you share as far as what what they experience? Like what key capabilities you thought were central to their success? I'm always intrigued like how the experience adapts from B2C to B2B. So anything there that you see as a key value driver? Yeah, I think, you know, on on the other side, there are again, very similar problems to overcome. Discovery of reliable producers, suppliers, vendors is always a challenge and multiplied when you're looking cross-border. Even when you do find them, coordinating with multiple vendors across time zones with language barriers, it can all be time consuming. And especially for small and mid-sized businesses that may not have dedicated sourcing teams to manage all of that. And then there's, of course, again, figuring out the logistics, the right freight provider at the right costs. Again, you know, small and medium-sized retailers or even some of the larger retailers around the world, I think during COVID have been severely challenged on that front. And therefore, much like what we do for the producers, for the buyers as well, we make it really simple. They come to our site, much like B2C e-commerce. They can discover products. There are different kinds of services we offer uh, vis-a-vis products. So there's ready-to-ship wholesale, which is really as simple as a B2C e-commerce experience where they can add to cart and there's a minimum order value. We've also done away with minimum quantities for that selection that we have on our site. Then they can just pay via the credit card or PayPal and just check out. And then for slightly larger buyers, we have an experience where they can come in on our site. They can select products that may not be ready to ship, need to be manufactured, but then they can put their own brand on it. They can uh, decide their own packaging. So essentially, it's simplifying private labeling. And we're able to do that again at uh, much lower minimums. But it's the similar process where they can add to cart, tell us what the customization requirements are. In this case, we enable a assisted checkout process where an account manager does get in touch with them to understand their requirements. And once that is finalized, it's it's the same process of just checking out. The order is confirmed. They get their updates and then the order gets delivered. They don't have to worry about anything that happens in between in terms of product getting manufactured, quality, compliance, logistics, none of that. It lands up at their doorstep where it needs to. So our endeavor has been on the buyer side to also just really make it simple, save their time, give them peace of mind in terms of reliability, and also give them the choice in a way that's really simple. So we're trying to take the ease and convenience of B2C e-commerce and bringing it here so that much like the producers, again, the buyers can focus on what they do best, which is focus on selling. Yeah, that's great. And now, Kalara, now offers more than 100,000 products across home decor, fashion, kitchenware, toys, jewelry, so much more. And you have more than 800 vendors now, is that right? We actually have more than 1,000 vendors now and and more than 150,000 products now. There you go. So perfect transition to my question. What has that path to scale looked like for Clara? Because I know there is obviously the acquisition side, so getting businesses to the site, interacting with it, but I'm sure there's the onboarding and acquisition for the artisans and the vendors. So how do those two areas play together? How have you reached this level of growth in scale, I guess is the big question. Yeah, I'm very proud of this, especially because I think my incredible team made it happen through COVID lockdowns and uncertainties and everything that came with it. 
there's, I think, a bit of method and a bit of madness to sort of how we went about it. I was fortunate to work with, uh, you know, a set of folks who came from an industry that sort of had very strong networks and understanding of what are the different production producing regions in the country, what are the different artisanal clusters across the country, broken down by categories, materials, skill sets. And, you know, we had that all mapped out across the country and Southeast Asia. And then we had our teams actually engage with them, assess, and we have a fairly, fairly intensive, like we handhold the process to onboard vendors and their products alongside pricing, specifications, MOQs, et cetera, because again, it's cross-border, helping them through that process in terms of pricing, which can be complicated sometimes, lead times and so on and so forth. We had to kind of find frameworks to standardize all of that, but still make it practical. So we invested a fair bit in doing that. We also worked with specific associations like the Fair Trade Association or the Exports Councils based in India and some of the other geographies through them, then, you know, reached out to the members of their community. So we did all of this. And then the way we kind of, we look for vendors, especially that conform to our values, in addition to, of course, meeting defined ethical and social compliance norms at different levels, they must, of course, meet our product quality standards. We also are constantly seeking out and even supporting, in some cases, those who are able to partner with us on newer product developments and also facilitate lower MOQs because, you know, we definitely see that as a demand from the buyers that we work with. So I think, you know, Alicia, I think it's just been the team really very focused with effort in sort of mapping out and covering each region in the country and making sure we're able to take that live and make sure that we're able to activate and keep the engagement going. So really no shortcut there. Yeah. And then are you guys actively trying to onboard new vendors like or are you kind of at the stage where you're just trying to maintain and nurture relationships on both sides? Like it's always interesting to me to to hear how how platforms in particular balance growing or expanding their user base versus retention. So where are your priorities now? We're still looking at growing. But we're very, I think, we're a lot more focused right now where we see specific gaps in terms of like, for instance, on wooden toys, we think there is an opportunity from a demand side, but I think we need to expand on the supply side. Or, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest in hemp products and therefore we would look on the supply side or work with existing vendors who work with similar fibers and then sort of see how do we expand their portfolio into hemp and other newer plant-based fiber categories or a lot of interesting stuff, you know, happening in recycled materials, then we're specifically going after and saying, okay, let's sort of build and strengthen this space of vendors specializing in recycled materials. So we're definitely continuing to grow, but I think we're a lot more thoughtful and focused about it in this current phase of growth. Got it. So you noted a few particular product types or product categories that are seeing some demand. So are there any other interesting trends that you're seeing? Because it's kind of a ripple effect, right? Like the consumer indicates what they want and that trickles down to the business that needs to respond. So they're actively looking for brands to fill those gaps. So are there any other particular areas that you think or you're seeing rise in prominence or demand that you think is worth noting for our listeners? Absolutely. I think the whole genre of eco-friendly substitutes to products that we use in our daily lives, whether it's the kitchen, whether it's the bathroom, whether it's the living room, whether it's our office, whether it's it's on us, our personal, whether it's for our kids. We're definitely seeing a very decided interest uh, where buyers want to add it to their assortment. And therefore, on the supply side, you know, we're seeing a lot of experimentation in new materials, uh, hemp I mentioned, but also other plant-based fibers, a whole host of recycled materials, not just fabrics, but also in, in ceramics using recycled materials, in rugs using recycled materials, in, you know, even fashion accessories using recycled materials. We're definitely seeing copper and brass and some of these metals being used as accents or, you know, coming in because copper, of course, because of its antibacterial properties. 
but also brass because of its inherent inert properties, especially in jewelry, we're seeing that. We're seeing, you know, definitely even natural dyes and, you know, natural like plant extracts coming in on just, you know, fabric surface techniques and surface embellishments. So the entire genre is definitely seeing a lot of movement. And I think in many ways, India and Southeast Asia are very well positioned for that because a lot of this deals with, you know, locally available natural materials, but also tend to be more labor intensive and require skill sets that this region has generationally had. It's just being adapted into newer applications. So crochet was being done with cotton earlier. It's now being done with hemp or jute. And therefore, it's, I think, relatively easier to adapt and, you know, be able to meet this demand that we are seeing grow. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting that it gets that granular, right? Like in your particular area of the retail world, it's not just like toys or bath goods. It's like the how the dye is made to color the item. I think I find that that fascinating. So I mean, thinking more broadly about Kalara and this B two B commerce and B two B e commerce in particular space. I'm curious if you're noting any more broader trends that may be impacting the future of your business, your future priorities, because again, it's interesting to see the correlations between B2C and B2B behaviors. Obviously, we're seeing more movement in B2B e-commerce. So, I mean, are there any particular trends that you think will really come into focus or even accelerate for B2B over the next year? Because I know like marketplaces are so huge right now, this intersection of commerce and values-driven buying are really top of mind right now. But what are you seeing? Because you're living and breathing this every day. Right. (laughs) I think aside from the broader movement towards more sustainable sourcing, in terms of products, we're also seeing that slowly but surely extend also into the supply chain. So I was at the London Gateway port last month, and I could see some very interesting investments in the port itself, in electric vehicles and renewable energy, powering the port itself. So we're definitely seeing on the supply chain side, this sort of sustainability moving broader, moving deeper into the value chain. Aside from that, this year, right, I think e-commerce around the world is definitely, or the growth of e-commerce on the B2C end is definitely also impacting the way people source. With brick and mortar businesses, people have typically sourced fewer SKUs at low to medium to higher depths, depending on the number of stores. But with e-commerce, the trend is definitely towards sourcing a greater number of SKUs, but with lower quantities and also faster turnarounds. And that's what I was alluding to earlier in terms of, therefore, the manufacturing also has to attune to that. And I think there's a lot of synergies there with, again, with artisanal or handmade or relatively labor intensive products, because we are inherently able to do that at lower quantities. We don't need those super high quantities to be able to make wooden toys, you know, using natural dyes or, you know, hemp crocheted bags or, you know, whatever the products might be. So there's definitely, you know, the nature of how our buyers or retailers are sourcing in terms of the quantity and assortment mix. And I think also just geopolitically, we're seeing buyers wanting to diversify their sourcing and not be limited to certain, you know, geographies. There's obviously, there's nearshoring, there's French shoring, there's, uh, and just broader diversification, of course, as well. And, you know, I think when buyers seek to do that, digital discovery becomes very important because you can't sort of have your backend sourcing presence across all of these geographies and you need more efficient ways to do that. So there's definitely a lot of interesting trends, even from a business standpoint that we're seeing on a day-to-day basis. Got it. And and to that end, I mean, how will these trends influence your priorities as CEO and, and the investments that are made for building the Kalara business, like the e-commerce experience, logistics, other areas, like how are you going to be balancing all of these areas of the customer experience and and where do your priorities lie over the next year? That's a great question. (laughs) It's a very exciting space. And like I said, it's it's also a space which has lots of challenges to resolve. So it's it's hard to prioritize. But, But I think there are definitely three areas that we are investing in. One is on the product 
the product development side where we want to, like I said, we want to lower MOQs. We want to make sampling and production turnarounds faster. You know, we want to simplify this whole process of customization, essentially working backwards from what to, uh, you know, buyers who are now multi-channel, wanting to differentiate their products in a growing democratized, but also a very competitive marketplace. So that's one area that we're definitely focusing on. The other is, is vendor development, where we're working with producers to also look at improving quality standards, improve packaging, and also facilitate, you know, ethical and social compliances. You know, while sometimes we see that there is skill and then there is, there are people wanting to work, but there isn't always access to either knowledge base or access to the means to be able to, to take it to a certain level where they're able to participate in the global economy. So that's that I would say is our second priority. And the third is supply chain. We are working with partners across US, UK, Australia, and even the Middle East to facilitate different kinds of fulfillment models across both air, as well as ocean, as well as last mile solutions. I would say these are three very important areas. But of course, aside from this, there's you know tons of other things that we're always working on. But these, I hope that, you know, in the next one year, we'd have made important strides. In. That's great, Aditi. Well, thank you again so much for taking the time out. It's always fascinating to get insight into the inspiration behind new businesses and evolving businesses, you know, what the growth priorities are and what all of the different platforms and players are bringing to the table. And I truly think that Kalara is really bringing something unique to the table. So thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you for your thoughtful questions. I think it definitely made me think and, uh, you know, reflect on some of the choices that we're making and why we do what we do. So thank you very much. Love it. Love having these discussions that dig a little bit deeper behind the upfront value. So to all of you, if you have any follow-up questions for Aditi about purpose-driven retail, about marketplaces or B2B experiences, we would love to keep this conversation going. Drop us a line on Twitter at our touchpoints or on LinkedIn at Retail Touchpoints or leave us some feedback, a rating, or review on your preferred podcast player. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, frankly, anywhere else we are likely there. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe. We are having new conversations every week with entrepreneurs, brand founders, and practitioners like Aditi. So when you subscribe, you get the latest and greatest conversations as soon as they drop. But for now, that is it for us, everyone. Thank you again so much for joining us. We will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up. <laughs>